robotics is changing uh, healthcare in many ways, but one of the most dramatic ways is, you know, we now have robots that are actually performing surgery on people. You know, a few years ago, my mother had, a, had an operation done by a robot. Uh, she wasn't serious, you know, nothing serious. She's fine now. My sister-in-law has been operated by one. I'm sure many of you know people that have had uh, surgeries uh, done by uh, uh, robot surgeons or, or guided by surgeons uh, uh, under the control of robots, but, uh, or robots under the control of surgeons, but uh, the other <laughs> one. I, actually, I'm not sure about that, but anyway. Um, um, and one of the things, as I've seen this from the research side, the business side, and the personal side that I'm surprised at is how accepting the public is of this technology, of having machines perform surgery on people. And, and so I, I ran a, across this advertisement off the internet some years ago that I had to download and keep. Uh, and it's, it's uh, fascinating when you look at it. It's a Photoshop. It's from a hospital in Miami, Florida. Photoshop of a, uh, a surgeon with a robot arm uh, put on him. Um, and it says, one part surgeon, one part machine, both parts amazing. And I think that captures in a lot of ways how the, the public uh, accepts this. In fact, they embrace it in certain ways. They, you know, the, the hospital's saying, we've got the top technology, you should come here. And I think this has been a success from a financial standpoint for these companies that are involved. Uh, and so that's encouraged a lot of folks to get into this market. Uh, a lot of different companies are trying to get a piece of this and, and expand the market and look at different procedures that can be done with different robots. And, and my lab uh, is no different. We've been able to take some of our ideas in, in microrobotics and turn those into steering catheters for treating heart surgery. We've gone all the way from patenting the idea to spinning off the company to actually realizing this in the clinic and, and uh, performing surgery on, on humans. Uh, and that's uh, uh, quite a gratifying uh, uh, realization to see your, your technology go that far. Uh, but we've also been interested over the years in, in a lot of retinal surgeries, ophthalmic surgery. And so one of the um, uh, diseases we've considered is, is age-related macular degeneration. It, it happens to be the leading cause of blindness in the industrialized world. If you're going to go blind, chances are it's going to be from this particular disease. Now, fortunately, there have been treatments available for some forms, and it's really helped halt the progression. Back my, coming back to my mother, she gets these every few months. She gets injections into, into her eye to keep the uh, uh, disease from progressing. My mother's actually quite healthy normally, but she does have... Uh, uh, these issues. So we've also thought about how we might use robots to help more precisely, safely, and economically deliver these, these drugs into the eye. Uh, these millions and millions of these injections are done around the world. So as I said, um, age-related macular degeneration is a leading, leading cause of blindness in the, developing, in the uh, developed world, in the industrialized world. But in the world as a whole, the leading cause of blindness is cataracts, something we simply don't suffer from here. If you have a cataract as you're getting older, your, your lens starts to get opaque, uh, there's a number of clinics in the area that can perform this surgery. So what's, what's going on? Why is this? And of course, the reason is that there's... Uh, uh, issues with, with uh, performing these surgeries. They're, 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 they require highly trained surgeons, uh, and they're simply not access in the developing world. So if you get a cataract in, uh, for instance, Botswana. I remember when I was a teacher in, in this small African village in, in Botswana, and one of my students had a cataract, and, and it, there was just nothing to do about it. He, uh, he was blind in that eye. Um, but, but fortunately, you know, healthcare is, in, in, is improving in the developing world. And there have been a lot of successes over the years, particularly in infectious disease. Uh, malaria, for instance, uh, from 2010 to 2015 in five years saw a 20% decrease in incidence of malaria and a 30% decrease in mortality from that. And these are because of programs like Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and, and very concerted efforts to try to address this. Tuberculosis is on... Is, is decreasing, and we're seeing the slope on that curve in the right direction. One, uh, coming back to Botswana, one of the most uh, uh, saddest stories uh, uh, has been uh, the, the incidence of HIV in that country. I left there in 1989, and I remember as I was leaving, talking to the, uh, the doctor in our local village clinic, he said, we're starting to see AIDS. This was in 1989. We're starting to see AIDS in, in our village. And he was worried, the nurses were worried, they realized what that meant, but the rest of the population really wasn't aware of what was going on. When I left there, life expectancy rates were at six, almost 65 years old. In 15 years, people had lost 15 years of their life. By 2005, life expectancy had fallen for the country to less than 50 years old. Now imagine here in Switzerland, if all of a sudden, uh, on average, our life expectancies went down by 15 years, that's dramatic. 
But, but the government uh, uh, took action, um, health organizations around the world took action and started educating the public. Uh, antiretroviral drugs became available and they started making sure they got all over the country. My wife and I just visited there last December to go to a wedding for one of our, uh, one of our friends whose son was getting married. And uh, life expectancy right now in 2017, 2018 is back to where it was in uh, 1989. So that's a, a positive story. And what was really encouraging to see is the joy the people and the appreciation the people have in this. So as we attended this wedding, uh, the weddings are kind of a, a two-part deal. The first day you go to the, the bride's home where the, the groom has to pay the bride price. And this particular bride was worth uh, eight cows, three goats, and a sheep. Um, and so they, 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 we go there, but during that uh, uh, visit there, there were traditional dancers that were singing about Botswana, singing about the village, singing about, uh, you know, positive, joyous things. And one of the things they uh, were singing about were HIV drugs. You know, imagine that. Uh, it's, it, uh, you know, I go back, and, and not many of my students are alive from when I was a teacher there now, but it's changed the, uh, it, it, people appreciate how it's changed their lives and they sing praise to the Festus Mogai, who was the president who implemented these. They, they shout out AZT, one of the drugs they, they use, and it's, it's changed, uh, it made, had a dramatic impact, and people appreciate that there. So there are a lot of positive things that have been going on in, in global health worldwide, but it's interesting to put it in perspective. So infectious disease, we've done well on. But if you look at HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis, and you, those account for less than 10% of the total uh, disease burden in the developing world. And there is an estimate now uh, that, uh, that almost a third of disease in the world period requires some sort of, of surgical treatment. Unfortunately, five billion people in the world simply don't have access to that. And in low and middle income countries, nine out of 10 people just simply can't get treated for cataracts, for uh, uh, esophageal cancer, for uh, a number of diseases that we can go in and actually have a pretty good success rate with. So I think this uh, next map kind of shows the story. The, the data's a little old, but I think it shows an interesting story. Blue is good in this map. These, these are uh, cataract treatment rates. These are the countries that are being well treated, and this is uh, from 2004, but I still think that's relevant. Uh, the, other, the green and the yellow countries are, are places that simply don't have uh, access to, uh, to this kind of surgery. But I think one of the things that's interesting to look at in this plot is India. There's a lot of poverty in India, but it's in the blue. They've made tremendous progress in addressing that because in, in India they've been very innovative in how they've addressed some of these needs for surgery. Here, here is something called the Lifeline Express. It's a, it's a train with an, an operating room in it, and it goes across the country, stops in villages, <coughs> treats people, performs surgery if necessary, and then moves on. And they've had a, a tremendous success, and they've, they've adopted these kind of practices as well and similar practices to treating cataracts and things that are... Uh, uh, no longer, you know, the, the leading cause of blindness in, their, in that country. So as, a, as an engineer and as a medical roboticist, we started thinking now, is there something we can do in this area as well? Is there technology can it bring to bear? So one of the things we went back to and we looked at cataract surgery. One of the really challenging uh, operations is something called a capsule orexis, where you have to make a very precise cut in the, in the uh, capsule that holds the lens to take out the diseased lens and replace it. And so we took the same technology that we developed for doing heart surgery, only we miniaturized it, and we turned it into a, a, a similar kind of a catheter-driven uh, scalpel that was able to achieve accuracies to within a third of the width of a hair, coming close to what the most trained surgeons, uh, ophthalmic surgeons, for instance, the ones here at Trimley Hospital, are able to accomplish. And so technology can help get over some of these hurdles, we think, that are standing in the way of delivering surgery. But we're not the only people that are starting to think about this. There's some groups around the world that are also starting to look at this. This is from Pietro Valdestri's group. Who's, he's now at the University of Leeds. And he's been looking at what he calls the $2 endoscopies. Uh, endoscopies are, are typically done uh, in the upper GI to look at your esophagus and, and uh, stomach and also in the colon, in the lower GI. Um, and if you can get in there and find these incidents of disease early enough, your chances of survival are, are greatly uh, enhanced. The problem is getting these out and doing these endoscopies. I visited a, a hospital in Francistown in Botswana when I was there recently, talked to the superintendent and he, uh, asked him what, you know, looking at what procedures they can do. And he says, oh, we can do endoscopies. Yeah, we do that here. Uh, and then he said, but 
actually at the moment all of our endoscopes are broken. Um, and so people weren't getting this analysis. So what Pietro's done is come up with some very innovative ways of, of designing completely new ideas in endoscopes. They're portable, they don't require uh, electricity, they, it's all battery powered, and going from village to village, he actually took this in Honduras to look at this. Uh, there's a new professor, uh, 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 Professor Salome, at the University of Basel, and she's been working with a group um, there's also a group at Columbia looking at this on how we can rethink magnetic resonance imaging technology. Magnetic MR is, of course, very important for looking inside our body and determining do we need surgery in the first place, but these machines cost millions of dollars. They're looking at reducing the requirements on imaging, on the, the quality of the image, and turning this into a device that's going to cost less than $50,000. And so that's going to open up diagnostic capabilities uh, that simply don't exist in the developing world right now. So. Finally, I want to talk about sustainable development goals. In 2015, the uh, United Nations came out with 17 sustainable development goals. The idea here is to help countries and uh, healthcare uh, and, and foundations provide roadmaps on how can we you know, create a sustainable world? What are some of the things? And they go all the way from eliminating poverty to energy, clean water, uh, to a number of different aspects. But of course, healthcare is a very important one. We need to achieve these healthcare, you know, Im improvements in healthcare in order to, to get uh, uh, to realize these type of, of SDGs, as they're called. Um, and there was a, a quote I'm, I'm taking here from some medical researchers at Harvard who pointed out right after this report came out, sustainable development goals cannot be achieved without explicit, explicitly addressing one of the most crucial needs facing the world, and that is a lack of access to surgery. We don't realize it here. A lot of the world just simply doesn't have access to surgical procedures. Um, it's been called the neglected stepchild of global health. And people are starting to come, I think, become aware of this. Um, I think it's a, we're going to require a multi-pronged approach to this. We're going to need innovations like we see in India uh, to treat uh, cataracts and to treat surgeries there. But I also think technology is going to have to play an important role in this. And so instead of having our startup and thinking about our exit strategies, maybe we can start thinking more about who, how, uh, how can we treat the most people at the lowest cost. So thank you very much.